Hello everyone, my name is Dan the Tutor. This is a clip from one of my weekly group tutoring sessions at the University of Delaware for Physics 201. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thank you and enjoy. Next up we have rotational equilibrium. So rotational equilibrium, this is a very specific topic in Torx and it's actually one of the nicer topics I'm gonna say. Why is that? So here's my notes on rotational equilibrium. It's literally as simple as this. The net torque is equal to zero. That's how you know we're dealing with a rotational equilibrium problem. The net torque is going to be zero. In other words, the torques going counterclockwise is equal to the torques going clockwise. And we already know the definition of torque. It's force perpendicular times the distance. So between these three equations, we can pretty much solve any rotational equilibrium problem. And how do you know it's rotational equilibrium? These things are going to be not rotating. Not rotating. They're held exactly in place. They're perfectly balanced. Okay, so let's look at the first one here. We want to find X given we have essentially a balance beam where we have a 2 kilogram mass on one side and 8 kilogram mass on the other. The one on the left is 34 centimeters and the other one is positioned X centimeters or meters away from the fulcrum of this lever. Now, I do give you centimeters here, and I do that for two reasons. Number one, uh, I want to make it hard for you guys. And number two, a lot of times in problems, they actually do give you centimeters. So then the question becomes, well, do I need to convert to meters? And I'm going to tell you two answers. Yes, and you can also get away if you answer no. What do I mean by that? So first, let's find the answer if we use meters. I'm going to say 34 centimeters. We all know that's 0.34 meters, or at least hopefully you know that. You just divide by 100. And now let's find out what these torques are. So notice it's kind of hard to see here. Nothing's rotating and we don't even have any forces yet. I'm going to tell you this. The force is gravity. The force is gravity. So notice here, I'm going to draw this in blue. For the two kilogram object, it's going to be mg going down. A mass of two, g is 9.81. And then for the eight kilogram object, I'll draw that in red. This vector is going down. Again, it's mg with a mass of eight and g is still 9.81. And then you might be asking, well, hey, don't we have normal force acting on these objects as well? Yes, you would be correct. However, I'm not going to draw them because for the free body diagram here, I only care about the free body diagram for the bar itself. Like notice, I'm only drawing forces acting on the bar. And the reason I'm doing that is because for rotational equilibrium problems, we only care about the bar. I don't care about the masses themselves, except for the fact that they have mass and they're causing a force of gravity downward on our bar. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, we're just going to do a couple examples today and hopefully it will start to make sense. So I'm going to say that this one on the left, these are my torques going, is that clockwise or counterclockwise rotation that we, that this would be causing? This would be counterclockwise and the eight kilogram mass mg, that's kind of causing this motion to occur, which is going to be clockwise. So then if I say to myself, the torques counterclockwise is equal to the torques going clockwise, the counterclockwise torque, that force, that two kilogram mass times G is 9.81. So that's the force. And again, torque is equal to force times distance. In this case, we don't even have any angles, right? So I'm not even gonna worry about the perpendicular part or the angle. So it's two times 9.81. What is the radius? The radius is gonna be the distance the distance from the pivot point. So the pivot point is located 0.34 meters away, 0.34, there we go. That's the left side. The right side, that's going to be eight kilograms. So eight is M times G is 9.81. And then that radius is X. That radius is just X. We're solving for X, right? So notice here, we pretty much have all the math. So I'm just gonna say, 2 times 9.81 times 0.34 on the left. That's going to give me 6.67 is equal to 8 point or 8 times 9.81. That's going to be 78.48 on the right or 78.48x. Then I just divide both sides by 78.48 and we'll get a final answer of x is 0.08 five in other words this is meters and as i said earlier you could have used centimeters for this problem and it's okay like normally we want to use meters right because meters is what we use in physics 
However, in this very specific problem, I'm just going to tell you it doesn't matter. For rotational static equilibrium problems like these, it doesn't matter if you use centimeters or meters if they give you centimeters to start with. If they give you meters to start with, you should use meters. If they give you centimeters to start with, you should use centimeters. And again, it's for these problems only. It's for these problems only. And by the way, if you did convert this to centimeters, you multiply it by 100, it would be 8.5 centimeters. This answer would be correct as well. Any questions here? So you all should be thinking one thing. You should have one question right now. And that is, for the clockwise portion, didn't I say that's negative? Like, shouldn't that be a negative sign right there? So that's a good question if you were to ask it. I'm going to tell you it doesn't matter because I kind of manipulated the equation so that I didn't have to worry about the negative. What do I mean by that? Well, remember, the original equation was torque counterclockwise minus torque clockwise is the net torque. And we're saying the net torque is zero. Why? Because it's not moving. So think of it this way. The torque itself is always positive. I repeat, the torque itself is always positive. The fact that it's negative came from the fact that it was in the clockwise direction. But notice if I add torque clockwise to both sides like this, ah, the negative sign goes away now, and that's how we ended up with this equation. And I really like this equation for rotational static equilibrium because A, it works, B, it's simple, and C, I do the same thing every time, and it works every time. Okay, any questions on what I just said? Cool. Now let's do one more example. This example is going to be significantly harder. I apologize. Eh, not really. I mean, it's good preparing you for the hard ones. So number two, find the normal force from the left and right sides. Okay, so this time I do care about the, the normal force, but I'm not talking about the normal force on this 10 kilogram box. Oh no. I'm talking about the normal force acting on my bar here. Because remember what I said in the last problem. I only care about the forces acting on the bar itself. So I'm going to draw a blue for the left, normal force right there. Let's say NL, and then in red I'll say NR, and that's the normal force from the right side. Now other forces acting on this beam. I will have MG going down from the 10 kilogram mass, which is good. And now there's one more force I do need to consider. And it has to do with the fact that this time, unlike the last problem, this bar actually has a mass. And the reason why that matters is because gravity is going to be acting on this bar as well. So I actually need to draw gravity from the bar. I'll say capital MG because the bar is bigger. It's 100 kilograms. Now, just real quick, I'm going to scroll up. And I want you to notice two things about this problem. Number one, for this problem, the bar didn't have a mass, so I wouldn't include it anyway. Second, I tried to position the fulcrum. I probably should have made this more clear in the problem, but I tried to position the fulcrum exactly in the middle of the bar. Why is that important? Well, I'm going to scroll down again. So with any mass system, whether it's a long bar like this or just a normal package like the 10 kilogram mass there, we're going to treat it as a point source of mass at the center of the object. I repeat, we treat the force or the mass as if it were just at one point in the center of the object. What does that mean? It means that if I were to think where is this mg located, it is located, if the whole beam is three meters long, it's located at the 1.5 meter mark. It's exactly halfway in the center of the bar. And that's important to know. So again, I'm going to set up the equation. Torques counterclockwise is equal to torques clockwise. And now we have a problem, I would say. If you were to do this equation, in every problem we've had so far, there was a clear pivot point. Like in the circle example, it was pivoted in the center. In the last balance beam problem, it was pivoted in the center. Like it was actually rotating about the center. We could see it clearly. Notice this one's not going to rotate at all. Like it's perfectly balanced on the left and right sides. There's no way it's going to rotate. Not a problem. It just means that we have the creative liberty of getting to choose the pivot point. So you can pick the pivot point on the left side. You can even choose the pivot point to be in the center right here. You can choose it to be on the right side. It doesn't matter. Now here's my advice to you. How many unknown variables do we have right now? I'm going to circle them. We don't know the left normal force. We don't know the right normal force. We have two unknown variables. So typically, typically in math, two unknown variables means that we need two equations. However, I'm going to tell us we only need one equation if we pick the pivot point to be exactly on one of our 
either left or right normal force. So I'll choose the left just arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. So what am I saying here? I'm saying this is the pivot point. Choosing your pivot point is an art just like any creative process. It takes practice to get really good at it. And in, and normally it the problem's pretty clear what they want you to be, the pivot point. Like you'll either tell you or it's very obvious, like in the two examples we just saw before this. When it's not obvious, you need to pick it. And I always recommend picking it in the spot that will cancel out one of our variables. How will this cancel out a variable? Well, think about this. What's the torque on NL? Well, torque is equal to a force, so NL, times what's that radius? In other words, what's the distance from the normal force to the pivot point? It's on the pivot point. That distance is zero. That whole torque is zero. We actually just lose NL in the equation. That's actually fine at first because we need to get rid of it in order to solve for one of these things first. We're going to solve for NR first. Everyone okay with that? If you're lost, don't worry. I think it will make more sense in the what I write next. So now we need to figure out what forces, what torques are going to be pointing counterclockwise. Remember, counterclockwise is this motion right here. And if I look at the forces, I see mg is going down and kind of in this clockwise shape. So mg is going to be clockwise. Capital mg is also going to be clockwise because it's causing it to move that way. And the normal force on the right, that will follow the direction of counterclockwise. So I'm going to say normal force points on the counterclockwise side. So that torque is equal to a force n sub r times the distance. What's the distance from nr to my pivot point I chose? Notice it's the full three meters here. So nr times three. I, I'm just going to tell you, don't worry about sine theta for this problem or cosine theta. There's no angles. Don't worry about it. Okay, now on the other side, I have lowercase mg, which is lowercase m is 10 kilograms. g is still 9.81. And that distance, what's the distance from the pivot point? Uh, it's kind of hard to see. It's kind of hidden. But I said it was one meter. That 10 kilogram mass is one meter away from the left side. So just times one. Plus my torque from the 100 kilogram mass. That's going to be a mass of 100 times G, which is 9.81, times its distance, which is 1.5 meters. There we go. And it's 1.5 meters because, again, it's located exactly halfway in between. That center of mass is exactly halfway in between the bar. So now we have all our numbers. The only thing we don't know is nr. Let's go ahead and do some algebra and solve here. So on the left side, 3n sub r. On the right side, I just need to plug this in my calculator. 10 times 9.81 times 1 plus 100 times 9.81 times 1.5 we're going to get a final answer of, well, not final answer, 1569.6. Then divide that by 3 to find the normal force on the right side. Divide it by 3. We're going to get 523.2 newtons. There we go. We found the normal force on the right side. That's half the battle. Okay, now for the left side. What are we going to do? How are we going to find it? You have two options here. Number one. You can say to yourself, oh, well, we picked the pivot point on the left here. What if we pick the pivot point on the right side now? Because then NR will go away. There's my new pivot point. And we're just going to do the exact same math to find NL. And you can do that, and that will work. And that's what I would recommend you do if, if you ever see this problem and you're not sure what to do. However, I'm going to tell you there's a much easier way to do it now that we know what NR is. So here's my question to you. We have rotational equilibrium. What does rotational equilibrium mean again? It's just a fancy word for not rotating. Here's my other question to you. We have translational static equilibrium here as well. You don't have to write that down. But translational static equilibrium means it's not just not rotating. It's also not moving. It's not moving up, down, left, or right. In other words, I can say my F net Y is equal to zero. I repeat, F net comma Y equals zero. What does that mean? It means all my forces pointing up is equal to my forces pointing down. This is Newton's second law back in the, the, the linear, the translational world, the not rotational world. So I'm looking at all my forces pointing up. I have two. I have normal force on the left, normal force on the right. So normal force L and L plus normal force right we just solved for 523.2. On the right side, the force is pointing down. Again, we have two of them, that mg and capital mg. 
So 10 times 9.81 plus 100 times 9.81. Notice with forces, I didn't have to factor in the, the radius, the distance at all. It doesn't matter for forces, which is pretty cool. And once again, I just need to solve the algebra here. So the right side, 10 times 9.81 plus 100 times 9.81. <clears throat> it is going to be a different number than before because I'm not factoring in the, the distance. So NL plus 523.2 on the right side, 1079.1. Subtract 523.2 from both sides. And we'll get a final answer of normal force on the left is 555.9 newtons. Okay, and now one more thing I want to mention. Notice normal force on the left is slightly higher than normal force on the right. Does that make sense? Should they be equal? I'm going to say no, they should not be equal. And just think about this in real life. See this 10 kilogram box here on the left side? Well, the, the left side should have a higher normal force because that 10 kilogram box is closer to the left side. So just from an intuition perspective, this makes sense. And again, the way we solved this question, we did two things. Number one, we said counterclockwise torques are equal to the clockwise torques. And that's because this thing's not rotating. Then once we found one of our sides, which we had to pick our pivot point, we chose the left side arbitrarily. We could have chosen the right side. It doesn't matter. Choosing the middle would be kind of tough because we'd have two unknown variables and that would be annoying. But the left side is a good one to pick because we limit it down to one variable now. Once we found NR, the normal force on the right, again, we said F net is Y. And this is a pretty common problem whenever you see two unknown variables like this. So it doesn't happen all the time that you use this <clears throat> equation, but this is when you would use it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want me to start doing free weekly group sessions at your university, please post in the comments below or email me at dan at danthetutor.com. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.